weather didn't just affect the game, it affected two teams' starting rotations. The Royals will turn to the bullpen. We'll tell you who it will be. Game one of a doubleheader is next on Fox Sports Kansas City. There is no threat for rain in Kansas City tonight, but because of last night's washout, the Royals and the Chicago White Sox will play two tonight at Coffin Stadium. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the ballpark. I'm Ryan Lefebvre with Royals Hall of Famer Frank White, and we signed off last night disappointed because there was not going to be a game, and knowing that both teams were going to have to shuffle their pitching staff to find two starting pitchers for tonight, and for the Royals, they're going to give Phil Umber his first major league start since 2007. A great opportunity for Umber tonight, Ryan, coming off the back of a rainout last night and Sean O'Sullivan not being able to go. And imagine Ned Yost looks at this for Umber tonight as his opportunity. The Royals have seen very little of Umber at the major league level this year. He's made one relief appearance out of the bullpen. That was against the Angels 10 days ago. They got a long look at him this year at AAA Omaha, where he has spent most of the year. Umber was a first-round pick of the Mets back in 2004. He was the third overall pick, and he was one of the big names going from the Mets to the Twins when the Twins traded Johan Santana to New York. He's going up against Freddie Garcia, who's had a great career overall, Frank, but he hasn't done much against the Royals. Well, he sure hasn't, Ryan. He hasn't done much lately on the mound for the White Sox. And the last time Royals faced Freddie Garcia, they got 12 hits, but only got two runs across the plate. So they have to do a better job of getting those RBI across the plate. And Ned Yost has a lineup filled with hitters who have done well against Freddie Garcia, but none better than Billy Butler, who is five out of nine against the White Sox right-hander. We'll have more from Coffin Stadium right after this. each morning and by the Missouri Lottery.
So what do the Royals need to do to beat the White Sox in this series? They can begin, Frank, by keeping the ball in the ballpark. Well, you're right, Ryan. You have to pitch down to these guys. They really are fly ball hitting team. The White Sox, three, four, five hitters have 72 home runs combined. So if you get behind and pitch up in the zone, these guys will definitely take advantage of you with the long ball. And the White Sox hit 10 home runs in a three-game series. The last time these two teams hooked up, that was in Chicago. Their lineup tonight is presented by m &I Bank, and it's the same lineup that Ozzie Guillen had for last night's game, which was rained out. There are some hot hitters in the lineup. Juan Pierre has an eight-game hitting streak. Paul Canerco is second in the league with 31 home runs, and Alexi Ramirez has a 13-game hitting streak. Another Royal that has done well against Freddie Garcia, among others, is Jason Kendall. Just 2 for 12 in the Cleveland series. He's a 4-17 career hitter against Freddie Garcia. It's the Royals and the White Sox, and the first pitch is next. Stadium in high definition brought to you by Time Warner Cable where HD is free with digital cable and it looks like we're going to have a nice crowd for the doubleheader and doubleheaders were made for the fans two games for the price of one before we get started let's go down to the field and check in with Joel Goldberg hi Joel well Ryan two pitchers for the price of one Phil Umber's only Appearance this year for the Royals came August 10th in relief of Brian Bullington. Tonight it's Umber in Game 1, Bullington in Game 2. Let's check out our Kia report on Phil Umber. And talking to Bob McClure, the pitching coach, he said, first off, just concentrate on hitting the glove. And then with that, keep it simple. Let Jason Kendall take the rest and then just hit the glove. And third off, repeat your delivery, something he said Kyle Davies did very well, better than he's done all year long on Thursday night. Stay on the attack and things will go well for Phil Umber. They think they can get five to seven innings out of him. And, you know, guys, it was interesting talking to Ned Yost. He said he didn't want to put Sean O'Sullivan in a position tonight where he had to come back 
and start again. Starters are so ritualistic. I said, well, what about Phil Umber, even though he's a starter in the minors, coming and starting this game on last minute notice? And he said, the opportunity outweighs the adjustment. Guys? Thank you, Joel. Let's take a look at the Royals defensively. And in the outfield, it's Alex Gordon, Gregor Blanco, and Willie Bloomquist. On the infield, one change from last night as Mike Avilas will be at second base. Chris Getz was going to start last night, but Mike Avilas has good numbers against Freddie Garcia and Jason Kendall. Back of the plate for Phil Umber. Well, good news for Juan Pierre because the game was washed out. He had an out washed out. He opened the game last night with a line out to shortstop, but that is off the books. So he steps in with an eight game hitting streak and a 277 batting average and Phil Umber throws strike one. I think one thing he want to come have back tonight, Ryan, is that same swing. Uh, he, in a line drive to shortstop, he'd like to get it about five feet over Betancourt's head for a base hit. I think the approach he'll still take. Royals at times have pitched him very well this year and getting him to hit the ball in the air. Doesn't have a lot of power. But when he puts the ball on the ground, he's a handful. Yeah, especially if he makes it to first base. And now he's got the bad stolen base record uh, that he's trying to reach. He's, he's doing a great job from what we saw him early in the year where he looked like he was really overmatched in everything that he does. But uh, he's really turned his season around. Well, Umber gets him to hit it in the air, and it's into the glove of Alex Gordon, one away. 89 degrees, but with the heat index, it feels like 97. Game started on time at 6:10. Time and temp brought to you by the parking spot. Easy to spot, easy to park. The parking spot at KCI. Omar Vizquel, like. Juan Pierre had an out a race because of the rain out. He flied out to left field in the first inning last night. Signed to be a pretty good defensive backup. He can play second base. He can play shortstop. He can play third base. But while Mark Tian was on the disabled list with a broken finger, Biskell got a lot of playing time at third. And even though Tian is back, Biskell is still playing at third. Mark Tian is the designated hitter. I really think they really like the way Biscell's playing third base. Early in the season, Mark got up to a bad start defensively, and, and I think an, an injury followed that, and I think that hurt his chances of getting his job back. Ball is right in the sun, but Bloomquist runs it down. And this time of day and into the early evening, you really have your hands full when you play right field at Coffin Stadium. Yeah, it's a tough spot to be in right field, and I, I talked to Mitch about that. He said one thing, not only that it's extremely hot, but you really have to concentrate just to see every ball off the bat. So a good start for Umber as he gets two fly balls. And now deals with Alex Rios. Alex Rios really has turned his season around. Last year, his hands were a lot higher, and, and they, they said, well, how did you hold your hands at, and when you're with the Blue Jays? He said, I held them down, which forced me to go back up and get in a better hitting position, and he started that this year, and, and it showed it great, greatly in his numbers, right? 17 home runs, and when he gets on base, he's a big threat to steal. Umber's curveball misses inside. One ball, two strikes. Well, just on a short look from Umber this last outing, the one thing that, that we did notice about him, Ronnie, he did have a real good curveball, and, and this is an outstanding curveball here. Even Jason had to get kind of side saddle to catch this one. Had a late break, good hard break, and, and that was right at the bottom of the zone where he wants it. And gets him with a fastball away. So Phil Umber gets the side in order.
and a few changes from the lineup last night. And Chris Getz was at second base as the Royals were getting ready to face Edwin Jackson. But Mike Avilas, who has excellent numbers against Freddie Garcia, is at second. Willie Blumquist, who was hitting ninth last night, bats seventh. And Unieski Betancourt will hit ninth. All facing right-hander Freddy Garcia. Here's the Kia report. Well, Ryan, when you look at Freddy Garcia, he's allowed five or more earned runs in five games this season. So that's a good opportunity for the Raws to score runs. Uh, but it, you go back to that last start where the Raws had 12 hits against Freddy Garcia, they only scored two runs. So the key is to be ready to swing. Doesn't walk many guys. And he gets a good call from the home plate umpire, Dan Bellino. Gregor Blanco walked. Last night, and then Jason Kendall was at the plate with one ball and one strike, and that's when the heavy rain started, and we never played again. Blanco had six hits in the Cleveland series. Royals taking that one two games to one. Got his first two doubles with the Royals and also stole a base. Lined into right field. And now Blanco at first with his six stolen bases. White Sox defensively presented by Suzuki. It's Pierre, Rios, and Quentin in the outfield. Omar Vizquel with his 11 gold gloves at third with Ramirez, Beckham, and Canerco around the horn. And A.J. Pierzynski, their Iron Man is behind the plate. So one Iron Man behind the plate, another standing at the plate, and Jason Kendall lifts it into center field. Rios dealing with the shadows of the lights off to the left field side. And Blanco is back to first, one down. Yeah, Jason's a little, look, usually a little more patient in that situation. Very rarely with a man on first with speed, he'll swing at the first pitch. So he must have been looking for a certain pitch and thought he could get to do something with it, but he flied it to center field. Normally you want to give Blanco a chance to steal that base. Now he can use his ability to hound the bat to get him over to third base. And now Kila Kaihue, who bats third. So not only is he flip-flopping at first base with Billy Butler, one of them as the first baseman, the other one as the designated hitter, but now they flip-flopped in the batting order as Keela bats third and Billy hits fourth. Curveball is low for ball one. That's the one thing that Freddie Garcia does well, Ryan. He very rarely throws the same pitch, the same speed twice, and the Raws really have to uh, be patient at the plate in terms of what to look for if you get too aggressive. He can, he can subtract a little bit and get you out front and break your timing. I think that's what he's really all about is breaking the hitter's timing. Back to Garcia. To Ramirez for one, to Canerco for two. So the Royals send just three to the plate in the bottom of the first.
hearty soups, salads, sandwiches, and breakfast items at Panera Bread. And by Thoroughbred Ford, save big on gas with the exciting new Fiesta. See it today at Thoroughbred Ford. Both teams sending just three to the plate in the first inning. Royals got a leadoff single from Gregor Blanco, but then Freddy Garcia got Kila Kaihue to bounce into a double play. Phil Umber with two fly balls and a strikeout in the top of the first. And gets Paul Canerco and throws a strike to begin the second inning. Canerco with 31 home runs, second in the American League, 85 RBIs, seventh in the league, and he's 10th in the league in hitting. By hitting 30 home runs, that gives him six consecutive seasons with 30 home runs with one club. And there's only one player right now in the major leagues who has a longer streak than that, and that's Albert Pujols, who has 10 straight with the Cardinals. Well, Paul's done a good job this year of using the whole field. He, when he gets in trouble, it's when he tries to pull everything. But you see him hitting home runs to set straightaway center and also right center field, so he's really seeing the ball a little bit longer this year. He is facing Phil Umber for the first time. Carlos Quinton on deck, and then Mark Tian after him. One hop to Bentoncourt, picks it off up the middle and throws out Canerco. So hard hit, but out. Now this is it's great reaction time by Unieski right here. He's extended, gets his ball right on the end of his glove, gets his balance back and make a nice throw. We've seen him make so many plays this year to his left, Ryan, and, he, and I don't think anybody in the league makes a play up the middle any better than Unieski Bedford has this year. So Umbers retired the first four and now got a fastball in on the hands of Carlos Quinton. Quinton's batting just 234, but he has 24 home runs. He's driven in 77. And five of those home runs have come against the Royals. Ten of those RBIs against the Royals. Well, they try to pitch him in, Ryan. If you don't get it in, he's going to get you. And that's why he gets hit so much, and he does crowd the plate. And that's where the Royals want to be. That's where most pitchers want to be on the inner half. But he does take advantage when you don't get there. And there's the good curveball from Umber. His second strikeout, two down in the second. But it's a real tight curveball. And after following that 94 mile an hour fastball, it looks like a fastball. And then hitters give up on it. And now uh, that, <laughs> you don't get no better now. Now nah, that's outstanding pitch. Mark Tian got a warm reception when he was introduced. He is the designated hitter for the White Sox tonight. One ball, one strike. Homer in his first game, coming back from the disabled list. And is six out of 16 overall, and he's driven in five. Went on the DL on June the 1st. He broke his right middle finger, so the middle finger of his throwing hand, fielding a ground ball, he had to have a pin surgically inserted. Bad hop that just hit him right on the tip of the finger. Popped up. Mike Avilas is there. Six up, six down against Umber.
Freddy Garcia gave up a single to Gregor Blanco to lead off the bottom of the first. And then with one out, he got Kila Kaihue to ground into a double play. Billy coming off four hits, two runs driven in in the Indian series. And he's hit in six straight. Down, no balls and two strikes. And back to a spot where he has spent a lot of time this year in the batting order. Especially when David DeJesus was healthy and David was hitting third, Billy was hitting fourth. I think Billy's got the kind of swing. You can pretty much hit him anywhere in the lineup and he's not going to change and he's not going to put any more pressure on himself to do any more than what he usually does. Grounded to Vizquel. One down in the bottom of the second inning. Tonight's sprint, you call it. And with so many catchers that turn out to be major league managers, we ask you, which catcher will make the best future manager? Is it Jason Kendall or A.J. Pierzynski, both in the game tonight? Jorge Posada of the Yankees or Jason Veritek, the captain of the Red Sox? Text 432-432, enter keyword Royals, followed by a space, and then A, B, C, or D. Standard text rates apply. I can't imagine this guy retiring as a player and being done with baseball. Well, I talked to him, Ryan. The first thing he wants to do is get big. He wants to get in the weight room. And he said, I always want to be a big guy. And he said, I can't wait to get through with the game. That's the number one thing I'm going to do. And you know what he's going to do number two is the bobsled with right. Willie Bloomquist. And then he might think right. about coaching. I'm not sure. But uh, I think he'll make a great, uh, great manager. I think he's got the demeanor. He's got the professionalism. He's definitely got the work ethic for, for for the job, but he can pass that on to the players also. And some guys will get away from the game for a year or two, go through a baseball detox, if you will, and then realize how much they miss it. And in the case of Kendall, and he's said this already even as a player, some guys really feel a need to give back to the game, which has given so much to them. And that's how he feels here. He feels like this is what he said. In his mind, he felt he could have gone to a, a contending team, but he thought that this is this opportunity to kind of give back and, and really help some guys get better. Flashy little play by Paul Canerco to get Wilson Bedemy. Of the current managers now, here are the former catchers, including Ned Yost. Joe Torre also played quite a bit in the field. Played catcher and also the corners on the infield, some third base and some first base. A strike to Alex Gordon. Alex, five hits and two walks in the Indian series. So he's on base seven times, and it's a one-hop smash to Gordon Beckham, and the Royals are down one, two, three, with three ground balls against Garcia in the second.
Look at that guy. You call it, which catcher will make the best future manager? 47% think that Kendall will, followed by Jason Veritek. Only 5% for A.J. Pierzynski. Well, I, I mean, I think A.J. would make a good manager. I think the one thing that you can argue with this guy on is that he's not aware of every situation on the field. I mean, any way he can take advantage of you on the field, he does. And, and I think that he would probably instill that into his players, and, and his players will definitely come to play because he's, he's an everyday player, too. Now, Frank, we have over time expanded the list to mostly swings and misplays in the field. The first pitch to Alexi Ramirez, I might want to nominate for the final third of the season list. He didn't swing. He misses the curveball there as Umber gives him three straight curveballs. But maybe a batter buckling on a curveball could make the list. Well, the. the the good curveballs will make you buckle, especially if you think it's coming at you. And this is a hard curveball from Umber. It's up around the shoulders. And he went he went back, and then he spun away. He didn't have any clue what this ball was going to do. So, <laughs> and it is it, a strikeout pitch. Chevrolet brings us Fox tracks on this pitch, and it's off, off the plate. But he just wanted it to be away from him, and he swung at it. He went from having the jelly legs to trying to get hit by turning his shoulder into it to in the end it was a strike i mean it was a it was a hard hard curveball from umber but it, it sort of backed up on him and it, it, when it started up the shoulders he felt it was going to be inside then when he when he flinched he can't swing anyway so it was just two moves in one you don't usually see that on a pitch Pierzynski flies out to alex gordon so umber has retired the first eight so i agree that's definitely uh an award winner. Put it on the list, Sammy. That's what backup curveballs do to you right here. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Strike. He'll get some ribbon on that one in the in the dugout a little bit later. Well, since we last saw Gordon Beckham, he has really picked up his game. Last year, played almost the whole season in the big leagues, one year after being drafted in the first round by the White Sox and had a very respectable rookie season, was among the rookie of the year candidates, but got off to a terrible start this year. But he hit 354 in July. And now all together hitting 251. The White Sox, for the moment, don't have an answer for Phil Umber. As Beckham flies to right, Umber begins the game with three perfect innings.
Sitting in the Buck O'Neill legacy seat at tonight's game. And Russ is busier in retirement than during his many years in the business world. Known as a mega volunteer through his decades of work with the United Way, the blind, elderly, and disabled. Willie Bloomquist out in a ground ball to short. Russ Mueller served in World War II and the Korean War and to this day visits more than 40 people in nursing homes every week. And if Buck were still with us and he read Russ's resume, he might get up and say, Russ, you can have my seat. Outstanding uh, volunteerism there. I mean, it takes a special person to do those kind of things, Ryan, where you just... You got it all regimented down. You're going to see 40 people. And every time you go see somebody, they, they're that, that much happier at the end of the day. It used to really make me feel good when we get going to caravans and we go to some of the small communities where they have nursing homes. And the people say, if it, if it wasn't for Royals baseball and listening to you guys on, on radio, I don't know what I'd do. So a visit is always nice. Freddie Garcia has retired the last five all on the ground. And when he's on, good sinking fastball, everything is down. He has had trouble this year leaving the ball up, however. He has allowed 20 home runs in 125 innings. And what makes him tough is that he changes speeds on a lot of pitches and and up is the one area when you change speeds, you can still get hurt. If he changes speeds and keeps the ball down, that's definitely what makes him tough, Ryan. And he has Avila's reaching. Vizquel is going to let it roll. Now picks it up before it gets to the bag. You know, that's the ball that it rolled all the way to the bag when Vizquel picked it up. And that shows you how deep he was uh, in this in this at bat. And normally you, that's a routine play. But I think a lot of teams play deep at third and this ball here which is a re should be a routine play becomes a base hit but you can tell where he had Michael Beelers reaching and lunging for this ball and, and pretty fortunate to keep this ball even fair. So that makes Mike Avilas five out of seven against Freddie Garcia and here's Unievsky Betancourt who had three hits in the Cleveland series so he didn't have a big series overall, but two of those hits were home runs, and he drove in four. And Betancourt leads the Royals with those 12 home runs. And I really don't think he could do what he's doing, Ryan, with the home runs and the RBI production if he was to use a two-strike approach all the time. I think I think you got to look to do more with when you have no count on you, 2-0, and 3-1. Oh, and one. I think those are the counts you really need to try to do more than just hit a single. And I, I, I like... You know, ask his approach, it, it, which would be my approach as a hitter. Then when I get the two strikes, then I'm trying to get a single. But I want to try to drive in some runs. He has done a lot of work with Kevin Seitzer ever since he arrived last year following the trade from Seattle. And he has taken three pitches that he would normally swing at. And... It's hard work to fall behind three balls and no strikes on Betancourt. Yeah, very hard work, but he may be looking for a, a certain pitch in a certain area. And right now, he, he hasn't been in that strong hitting count. Normally when he has that 2-0, two 2-1 -oh, two count, that's when he chases out of the zone. Then we take a look at Fox Tracks here, and this is just right on the outside corner. Now, this, this is definitely Freddie Garcia's pitch right here at 3-0. You don't want to swing at that, and you really don't want to swing at it here at 3-1 either because Unieski needs something middle in and up a little bit to really hurt Garcia. And one thing the Nadios might want to do here, sometimes managers do put hidden runs on a 3-1 count, and... And if Freddie's getting that, as many ground balls as he's getting, this might not be a bad count to hit and run in. Popped up, but that'll land in the lower seats. Three balls, two strikes. Coming up on the next homestand on Monday, August the 30th, it's a Royal Night where fans can buy $5 high B level tickets when the Royals take on the Rangers.
For more details or to buy your tickets right now, go to Royals.com or call 1-800-6-ROYALS. Now Avilas runs, and Betancourt grounds to short to second. Didn't get him. So running pays off as the Royals avoid a double play and have Avilas at second base with two down. Uh, Mike's running three and three and two right here, and this is a, a really a heads up play by between Beckham and, and, and Ramirez. This is when you play together and you can get that trust between each other, but didn't get a good throw to Beckham, but he did an outstanding job turning the ball to the first base to get the one out. So no double play, but it is scored 6-4-3. And now Gregor Blanco with a runner at second base. Blanco led off the bottom of the first with a solid base hit to right field. In addition to an outstanding series at the plate, Gregor Blanco made one of the best catches any Royal has made all year in the outfield, diving into left center field. Unfortunately, it was right in the middle of the Indians' comeback. Pierre and Vizquel can't get there. No balls, two strikes on Blanco. Tonight's number for our Take the Field sweepstakes is 58. If you'd like to win a pair of replica Royals jerseys, go to FoxSportsKansasCity.com during tonight's game and enter the sweepstakes, including the number 58. There's a jersey winner every game, and one fan will throw out the first pitch at the 2011 Fox Sports Kansas City jersey giveaway game. Blanco strikes out. And the Royals leave Avilas at second base. On our turbo speed pitch comparison, Phil Umber, seven miles an hour in front of Freddie Garcia so far. Remember, you can double your speed with Roadrunner Turbo from Time Warner Cable. Three perfect innings for Umber. He got Juan Pierre to fly out to left field to open the game. Umber has three strikeouts. And two of those with his best pitch, his curveball. Here thought about laying one down. And now behind in the count, one and two. So Wilson Betamete 
who was playing in to defend against the bunt can relax now and deepen up on the left side. Chop to Uni, grabs it with the bare hand, throws high, and Keela came off the bag. Pierre gets an infield base hit. Well, you don't see this too often, Ryan, where a, high, a hard high hopper like that is taken bare handed. You, you get your glove and keep your balance, you make a good throw down. And, you know, he just didn't even try to catch this ball with his glove at all. And you, you have to wonder what kind of grip he had on it when he let it go. And you can see where Keeler tried to get up and get it. But that's when you might want to try to use that base to help you get straight up. But my question is, why would he feel that ball with his bare hand when, when it's up around your eyes? I mean, you get it right there. You're right in balance. You got a chance to get a good grip. When you get it like that, you don't know what the grip's like. And then you get a high throw. And that's one of those plays you say, hey, it didn't have to happen. And now we'll see how Umber handles the running game because the man at first base leads the American League with 48 stolen bases. And the man at the plate is a good bat control man. Just had a little deja vu, Frank. Juan Pierre, similar in size and in style to Kenny Lofton. Lofton had more power than Pierre did. But remember when Kenny Lofton led off for the Indians, Omar Vizquel batted second, and Roberto Alomar batted third. Man, you never knew what those three were up to. They might be swinging away. All three of them weren't afraid to lay down a bunt. All three of them could steal a base. And that was before you got to Manny Ramirez and Jim Tomey. Albert Bell. On and on and on. Travis. Well, Travis Fryman. Fryman. I mean, just a heck of a ball club. And those three guys, they, they play two different types of games. They played the speed game up top and the, and the big game in the middle. And just, that's what made that team so great. And the one thing that really made them uh, fun to watch is that they, they, they all were fundamentally sound offensively. It wasn't anything they couldn't do. And, and this is an outstanding pitch here uh, from Humber on the outside corner down. That's change up. But it just a good run to it. But it was just so much fun. You know, you were never out of the game. You know, when, because they could beat you in so many ways. And they could all steal bases. It was unbelievable. Pierre runs. The Royals pitch out. Vizquel throws his bat. And Uni missed the tag. The throw was there. And Pierre looked like he did a good job of sliding to the outside of the bag. But the Royals just gave an out away. Well, Vizquel did everything he could by throwing a bat, trying to foul this ball off. But you see right here when he picks this ball up, Ryan, this is when he's got to let his body continue to go and stay down with Pierre and make sure he covers that out of half. He didn't. He drops that left knee, wheels around. He's got a chance to make that tag. That's why I say you got to be willing to get down and dirty with guys coming in, especially if they're going head first. I was getting ready to say Jason Kendall threw him out again. I know. I mean, the ball was there. But I think if Unieski had have gone ahead and when he took that ball on the short hop, just go ahead and drop that left knee, then that would have allowed him to cover the bag. I mean, now you watch his right knee. He drops his right knee instead to make the catch. But now he's got he's to follow through and just go right on and dive right in on the play. Old foul off the tarp, and in fairness to Betancourt, that is a tough play trying to grab that short hop quickly and then try and find the runner shortly after that. Well, if the short hop's the easiest one, though. You don't want that in-between hop. But short hops, they catch all the time. I think you should always catch short hops, but but I think that once you got it, you always keep going in that direction because it's taking you back to the bag, and then you got to say, okay, I got to get down in here with him and try to get this with this tag made. So 49 stolen bases for Pierre. He is the only current major leaguer that has eight different seasons of at least 45 stolen bases. Just missed outside with the curve.
Piskel is playing at third base tonight, but as a shortstop, has the second most hits at that position all time. Only Derek Jeter has more. That's into center field. Pierre coming around third. And Blanco throws it all the way to the plate. There was no chance at all to get Juan Pierre. None. And Vizquel easily moves up to second base. Omar still has that nice short swing run. He just hits his fastball right back through the middle and right into center field. And this is where Blanco, being a young player, is going to have to learn how to come up and throw this ball down and realize he's got the, one of the fastest guys in the game on second base and there's no play. But you got to throw the ball down. If you want to throw a home plate, that's fine. But make sure it's down to prevent that batter runner from taking the extra base on you. And a curveball is in for a strike to Alex Rios, who struck out swinging at a fastball in the first inning. 17 home runs for Rios, three of those against the Royals. And he has driven in 10 against KC this year. Great curveball. And it's 0 and 2. So at least in the first four innings, if Umber is throwing his curveball, even if he's throwing it for a strike, not necessarily trying to bury it and get a strikeout. He's got the White Sox knees wobbling. You just don't see many good hard curveballs like that. It doesn't have a real big dip in it. It just, just nice, quick, looks like a fastball, and, and all it does is get you to flinch a little bit, and that's all it needs. That's four strikeouts now and three on the curveball for Umber. You can see this come right off the top of the finger and then this real nice tight spin to it and just right on the outside corner just where Jason Kendall was holding his glove. And now Paul Canerco with Vizquel at second base, one out. Canerco grounded out to Betancourt, a sharp one hopper to the Royals shortstop. One ball and no strikes. The key when you have a good curveball is still to have a fastball to go with it because if the White Sox at some point realize that that's the pitch that Humber's going with over and over again, they'll start sitting on that pitch. Well, they will, and the fastball really sets up everything, and, and he's got the good good fastball, 94 miles an hour, and but he's just got to make sure that he doesn't hang it. A lot of times when you throw a hard curveball like that, sometimes he doesn't uh, – it backs up on you. When it backs up out over the plate, that's the one that gets, especially if you throw it in the middle of the plate, trying to get it away, and it backs up in the middle of the plate, that one gets hit. We were trying to throw it in the middle of the plate, and it backs up, and that comes in, as we saw to Ramirez earlier, and that, that pitch is hard to hit. Three balls and no strikes. As far as throwing a hard curveball, Umber had a good curveball coming out of high school, and then he went to Rice University. And as a freshman, he had a chance to make the starting rotation. And as he was getting ready to go home during winter break, he asked the Rice coach, what do I need to do to make the rotation? And the coach said, you need to throw your curveball harder. So he went home, and he went to the high school batting cage, no catcher, no hitter, a couple buckets of balls, and just learned how to throw his curveball harder during winter break. And when he got back to begin the regular season, he was in the rotation. Jeff Neiman was also in the starting rotation. Off the glove of Vedemit, nobody covering at third base. Vedemit throws it off of Keela's glove. So there was a lot going on during that play. None of it looked good. And the White Sox have runners at first and third with one out. But this is a high hopper here and, and really just hit it off the heel of his glove. A very catchable ball right here, Ryan. And then he kind of arrow mails at the first base and Keeler jumped. But I think he was lucky <laughs> that that didn't go over his head. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't feel that ball at the top of his glove. And this is one that, that Wilson really should just held on to. And you see Keeler jump 
didn't feel the ball at the top of his glove, had no clue where it was. And then you got Omar Vizquel easing in the third base, and he's just taking a look at the play. It's going to be a single for Canerco. And now they've changed it to just simply an air five on Betamid. At first, it sounded like a single and an air, but it is just an air to Betamid. So the Royals keep piling up the airs. And are second right now. And errors committed in the American League only because the Indians committed five the other night here at Kauffman Stadium. Well, that play was very, the very catchable ball. And uh, when you see him bobble the ball and then the throw to first base, he's still fairly close. If he figured he catches the ball, he's got Paul Canerco, who doesn't run very well. It definitely would have been an out. Fly ball to shallow right field. The scale will not tag. So Umber comes up with a good pitch to Carlos Quentin, who has driven in 77 runs. And he can't get the runner in from third base with less than two outs. Let's take a look at tonight's league leaders. Brought to you by your Kansas City area Toyota dealers. And in the American League wild card race, the Tampa Bay Rays lead with Boston five and a half games back and the White Sox seven and a half back. So the White Sox right now have a better chance of winning the division than they do the wild card. They have already picked up a half game today without doing anything. Minnesota scored three runs in the bottom of the first inning at home against the Angels, so it wasn't looking good for the White Sox, but they didn't score again, and the Angels went on to score nine. So at the moment, Chicago is four games back. They just finished a series in Minnesota where they lost two out of three. Lost a couple of one-run games and then one on Wednesday, 11 to nothing. Mark Tian popped to second base in the second inning, has runners at first and third, two down, and fouls it away. And as I was looking at what the White Sox did in Minnesota, it just reminds me of several years of games against the Twins. It seems like you lose the close ones, and if you're going to beat them, usually you beat them big. You beat them big. That's right. You're right, Ryan. I was talking to Matt Thorne about that series up there, and I said, well, how, what was the excitement like in, 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 the, in Target Field? And he said it was unbelievable. He said sold out every day, playoff atmosphere, and that's the feeling you want to have this time of year. Mark Tian reacquainting himself with a lot of friends with the Royals, in the Royals family, Royals fans, and saying how much he misses Kansas City, and I think he means it, but at the same time, he's happy where he is right now. He's experiencing a divisional race for the first time. Not only was Minnesota sold out when the White Sox are there, but Chicago is sold out. So Umber gets around the air, only allows the one run, and he has struck out five.
pretzels and Pepsi products you can handle for one low price. Again, that's September the 1st, Royals.com or 1-800-6-ROYALS, if that sounds good to you. Oh, and two to Jason Kendall, who flied out to center field in the first inning. Kila Kaihue behind him, followed by Billy Butler. Royals have two hits against Freddy Garcia. Blanco singled in the first inning. Avila's had an infield single in the third. And so far, Garcia keeping the ball down. Seven of his nine outs have been ground balls. This is lifted to center. Only two outs have been in the air, and both times it's Jason Kendall flying to center field. So one away, and we go back to, you call it, presented by Sprint. Which current catcher will make the best future manager? And right now it's a two-horse race between Jason Kendall and Jason Veritek. Jorge Posada, and not a whole lot of love so far for A.J. Pierzynski. Kendall's father, Fred, was a major league coach for a time and spent some of that time here in Kansas City when Buddy Bell was the manager. He was Buddy's bullpen coach. A little high, one ball, one strike on Keela. He grounded into a 1-6-3 double play in the first inning. They just try to maybe not try to do too much against Freddy Garcia. Just kind of stay back, let the ball come to you, and, and trust your hands. He's got quick hands. You just got to trust them to work. And, and a lot of times when you're trying to uh, impress too soon, you try to go out and try to get the ball when you should stay back and let it come to you and then use your hands to hit it where it's pitched. Hit hard to Beckham. That spills out of his glove, but he recovers in time to get Keela. So another ground ball out for Freddy Garcia. But this ball's really hit well by Keela. He get, gets an all-speed pitch and he pulls it on the ground. Beckham didn't get and, and didn't quite get in front of this ball on the side just a little bit. The ball comes up, but he's able to keep it close by. See it come up and it hits the heel of the glove, keeps it close by, picks it up with his bare hand, which is what you should do, and then make a nice throw to first base. Big curveball. That was a Joaquin Soria-like curveball, 67 miles per hour. A strike to Billy Butler. He grounded out to third base in the second inning. And off speed again. Billy drives it to deep right. And Quinton right in front of the warning track. There for the out. And at the end of four, Chicago leads 1-0.
Cuomo. And I think right now Philip Umber has done a great job of showing the, the, the White Sox something they probably haven't seen in a while is that hard curveball. And, and a lot of guys don't throw it. He can throw it that consistently and for that long a period of time. Alexi Ramirez jumps on the first pitch. And Gregor Blanco is there for the out. So Ramirez with a 13 game hitting streak is 0 for 2. Joel Goldberg. You know, Ryan, earlier in the year, I remember talking to Scott Pitsednik about his name and how it was pronounced, and he said, well, you know, it kind of depends. It's Pitsednik, but then again, some people and relatives call it Pitsednik. Talking to Phil Umber, and of course, we know that the H is silent. See, he's been called everything from Hum, Humby, Hummer, anything with an H in it throughout his whole career, and even as a kid, he said the H is silent, but then again, the name and the origin of it is from England, and in England, they have the Humber River. So he said, I don't know. Maybe it is Humber, and if it is, and the H isn't silent after all, I'll be pretty mad to find out it was wrong all along. <laughs> A.J. Pierzynski with a one-out single to right field. I did notice that, that as you said, Joel, the H is silent, yet even the people like his teammates who know the H is silent, the nickname, you can hear the H. So his last name is Umber, but one of his nicknames is Humby. Well, it wouldn't really sound good to call him Umby or <laughs> Umber point. or Um or Umbo. Just put a G on it. Gumby. <laughs> <laughs> He's tall. <laughs> Well, and he's made a couple hitters look like Gumby when he throws the curveball, especially right at the right-hand batter. He had Alexi Ramirez, who just made out to begin this inning, twisted up like a pretzel when he threw him a curveball back in the third inning. Imagine all those years later finding out the pronunciation. It really is Lefebvre. Oh, I thought it was Lefebvre. Is that how you say that word, pronunciation? Pronunciation. Oh, okay. Speaking of. <laughs> you know, it's early, Ryan. Yeah. It's only 710. Is there an H in that word? <laughs> <laughs> Two balls and one strike on Beckham. He flied out to right in the third inning. He is hitting six straight. So Juan Pierre, the leadoff man, now is a nine game hitting streak. Alexi Ramirez with 13 in a row. He's 0 for 2. And now Beckham with 6 in a row. So those are the White Sox hitters that are swinging the bat well coming into the series. Pierzynski runs, and Kendall throws it into center field. So that was definitely a hit and run. Pierzynski running. That's the first tip off. And then the pitch that Beckham swung at. That was the next tip off. Well, first of all, him running anyway when he when he holding him on, you don't see that. And you know, Taco Bell shows us through Fox tracks is a fastball up, and this throw Jason Kendall never really got on top of this. Got on top of this, he he just got underneath his foot, his front foot slipped from underneath him, and that what that's what took the ball up and out in the center field. So you got to always land on that toe and get a good footing. He landed on his heels. You hear Bob McClure talking about pitchers landing on their heels and throwing up uphill, and that's what Jason Kendall did right there. Infield is in halfway, and that's because of Pierzynski's speed. And it's grounded to Betemi, who committed an error last inning, fields that hard ground ball cleanly. And Pierzynski is still at third base. Now, some might be crying for obstruction, or in this case, interference. Get those two mixed up from time to time with Kendall hitting Beckham, but Beckham didn't do anything wrong. He's right there in the box. So that was Kendall making contact with Beckham. That wasn't necessarily Beckham making contact with Kendall. Take a look at Jason's first, his left foot when he comes forward. Beckham stays in the box. But see how Jason really got his legs out there and he got on that heel 
he just overstrided and got on his heel. And then when he when he went to throw to second base, watch him spin out and spun right into and hit Beckham right in the back with his hand. Catchers, you got to keep those feet closer together. You got to be quick with those feet. When you get that stretched out, when you get out on your heels, and you just spin, and, and that's what you saw Kendall do on that throw. Juan Pierre singled, leading off the fourth inning, an infield single, stole second, scored the game's only run. He has one for two. As far as on the base paths, a runner interferes with a fielder. A fielder obstructs a runner. Yeah, the, the fielder has the, I mean, the runner has allowed a fielder an opportunity to field the ground ball. Deep short under Betancourt's glove, and I think Pierre is safe no matter what. Pierzynski comes down from third, and the White Sox lead 2-0. This ball's hit hard to Ben Court's left to right to his right, Ryan. I think I think the one thing you'd always like to do is you can catch the ball, catch the ball, it makes it a lot a lot easier. And you, you can see Yuni's frustration right there. He may not have had a play at first base, but he really thought he should have at least caught the ball. He goes just right right under his glove, just beat him to the spot. And you know, AJ's really running hard on this one. <laughs> he can take his time on that base hit coming down from third. And now Pierre in a running situation at first with two down, and Umber knows that. Pierre has already stolen his 49th tonight, and he scored on an RBI from Omar Vizquel. The White Sox decided last year that they wanted more speed this season. So they traded for Pierre. They picked up Alex Rios last year and those two have really improved the running game but at the same time those guys just run I mean Pierre leads the league in stolen bases he's also been thrown out more than anyone in the league Alex Rios is 10th in the league in stolen bases but he's been thrown out the second most times so Ozzie Gian's approach sounds like we're just going to run but I think that's what that's the approach. Obviously, they're gonna they figure they can force some mistakes, and and we don't know how many balls like the one Kendall threw in the center field. They've been able to take advantage of and go to third base. But also, uh, and from, from a hitter standpoint, you get a better chance to, to get something good to hit here because the catcher knows that Pierre is going to run. And he's going to call more pitches to the out half of the plate and try to give himself a lane to throw down down the second base. And most times, it's going to be a fastball. And Vizquel. As his second hit, third time he's hit the ball hard tonight. And now two on for Alex Rios. The White Sox have the second most stolen bases in the league. They've been thrown out the most in the league. Well, you see right here, Ryan, we talked about it. This, this pitch is away, and the catcher, Jason Kendall, stayed on the outer half every every pitch in this at bat. And Vizquel stayed with it because he wants an opportunity to throw uh, Pierre out at second base. A veteran hitter would know that. Rios has had an awful time with Umber tonight. He has struck out swinging at a fastball. He has struck, struck out swinging at a curveball. Number with five strikeouts and four of those on the curveball. It's interesting, I was telling you last inning about Umber in college trying to add more velocity to his curveball and throwing to an empty batting cage as one ball after another. He also learned from a teammate at Rice to make sure it was an over the top curveball. He had a teammate that would put a bucket in front of him by about two or three feet and would just throw the curveball right into the bucket. So really try and get on top of it and throw it straight down into the ground just to get that feel of getting on top and making sure it breaks down as opposed to 
a curveball that is described as casting, where it actually goes up out of the hand and then down, and the hitter is able to pick that up pretty easily. So they're more than 12 to 6, but only with a lot, lot tighter spin to it. And I think just having a hard fastball and a hard curveball, just having that change up in the middle of those two really makes him that much more effective. Missed outside, one ball, two strikes. That's how Nolan Ryan started. Uh, he had the hard fastball and he had the real hard curveball. He didn't have an in-between pitch, and he got a lot of check swing strikes on the on the hard curveball because out of his hand it looked like, looked like a fastball. And when you recognize it's not, you're already halfway through your swing. Laid on the fastball, one ball, two strikes. So there's the effect of the curveball right there. Rios thinking about it, staying back, and he gets a hittable fastball, and he's not ready for it. it it's in his mind for sure, Ryan, and that's why you saw that play that ball off to the right side like that. And, you know, Jason's trying to get it on the outer half of the plate, and he got it just where he wanted it, and he just didn't even get a, a good weight shift. It's more upper body, but you just want to throw this curve where it goes down and away and not in. You don't want the one to throw at him and then come out over the plate. You want that one in the middle and goes away. They got the last strikeout on it. I remember wa watching Daryl Kyle pitch, and he had a great curveball. But he would get a lot of strikeouts on fastballs because he had the hitter thinking curveball that he could slip that fastball by him, and they weren't ready for it. They'd either swing and miss or they'd take it for a called third strike. So he got his share of strikeouts with the curve, but I was surprised how many he got with the fastball. Rios goes down to get it and golfs it to left field. Alex makes the catch. That ends the inning. The White Sox add a run and lead 2 0. Trivia question. Who is the White Sox all time single season home runs leader? We always begin in the house. And I thought we had that figured out right away because a White Sox great is in the house. Frank Thomas, the big hurt. So I went to the record book and it is not Frank Thomas. I'll give you a hint. You have said his name tonight. Wilson Bedemit has grounded out to first, grounded out hard to Paul Canerco. Ahead of Freddie Garcia, two balls and one strike. Alex Gordon will follow him, and then Willie Bloomquist. Royals have two singles, one of them an infield single against Freddie Garcia in the first four innings.
Two balls, two strikes. The Royals are facing Freddie Garcia when he's not particularly pitching well, at least before tonight. Frank told you that he got pushed around in his last start. That was on Sunday against the Tigers. He took a no decision. And his ERA in his last five games is over eight. He had a stretch where he went nine and one. But now in his last five, one win, two losses, 8.44 ERA. But so far tonight, he's given up two singles in four innings. Change up is hit high in the air to right field. Quinton is back, still back. It is gone. That thing seemed to hang in the air forever. And Alex Rios came flying in out of nowhere from center field, tried to climb the wall. Wilson Betamit hits his seventh home run of the year, and it's a two to one game. We talked about Freddie Garcia, and when he gets hurt, Ryan, he gets hurt up in the zone. And to this point, everything was down, and, and he was got the the wrong hitters hitting the ball on the ground. But he leaves this change up, up, out over the plate. And then Wilson Betterman gets through this ball very well. And I think he knew right away that this ball is going to be gone or off the wall. Back with a fastball for a strike to Alex Gordon. Betamid hits his second home run of the homestand. He homered and had four RBIs against the Indians. One and one to Alex. And a curveball drops in. One ball, two strikes. Alex hit it right on the nose in the second inning, but grounded out to Gordon Beckham at second base. Lays off the splitter, and it's two balls, two strikes. That is the 21st home run of the year allowed by Garcia. And Alex got a pitch up, but it was in on his hands, and he fouls it away. I think uh, Ozzie Ginn could live with that uh, if it's solo. If you're not walking guys in front of it, and they're not two and three run homers, then you can you can overcome a, a solo home run. Off speed and line to Beckham. So Alex can't get it past the White Sox second baseman, and that's the first out of the bottom of the fifth. Well, Alex can really take uh, a lot of stock in the fact that he has uh, squared up two balls today. He's been able to wait on the off-speed pitch and center the ball. Can't tell it where to go, but he's just pleased to feel that his swing is right where he needs it to be. Really, Bloomquist grounded out to short in the third inning. And he drives that to left field. Pierre was shallow. He is back, reaching, and made a great catch up against the wall. Right here, Willie does a good job of waiting on this all speed pitch and really got good, good wood on it. But this is what speed does for you, Ryan. Speed runs down those mistakes. You might take a step the wrong way, but you can make it up with speed. And Juan Pierre did a good job right there of running that ball down right at the wall. Good concentration, little jump there at the end. Nice play. So the Royals have hit two bullets after the Betamid home run, but out. And now Mike Avilas had an infield single his first time up. And now down, no balls and two strikes. But the one thing that Freddie Garcia is doing this inning, Ron, he's starting to elevate the ball a little bit more, uh, especially on the off speed. You change up, that's going to get you in trouble. Your curveball up is going to get you in trouble. You can get away sometimes with a fastball up, but those pitches get squared up pretty good. Heat index, well over 90 at first pitch in the upper 90s. And even though Garcia hasn't had a long inning since, 
he still is going to have to battle the heat. But after giving up the home run, he retires the next three. Wilson Betamit hits his seventh of the year and makes it a one-run game. to transmit anything you want Verizon and by Chevrolet come see for yourself why a thousand people a day are switching to Chevy see your Kansas City area Chevy dealer no rain but a hot humid night in Kansas City and a two to one game through five innings Wilson Betamit banging his seventh home run of the year in the bottom of the fifth to make it two one White Sox with a run in the fourth and one in the fifth. Vizquel and Pierre driving him in. And Paul Canerico comes up with nobody on in the sixth inning and fouls the first pitch off of his foot. Just talking about the heat in the last half inning. Now Umber has had to work harder than Garcia so far. He has a couple of 20 pitch innings. And has thrown 82 pitches. Garcia has thrown just 61. So the heat is going to affect both guys, but tonight's a night where you want to be very pitch efficient as Canerco singles to lead off the sixth inning, and he is one out of three. You can see where Canerco's different. Uh, Taco Bell shows us through Fox tracks. He takes this ball down the middle of the plate, Ryan. That's a ball that. He would normally try to turn on and try to pull, but he stays right with this pitch and drives it to right field for a base hit. So just looking like a lot smarter hitter at this time. Really no place to pitch him right now. Right, I agree. Carlos Quinton is struck out and flied out to right. Quinton with five home runs and 10 RBIs against the Royals. So off to a good start in this series, holding him 0 for 2. Canerco got stuck in no man's land, and he still gets to second base. Been a tough night of throwing so far for Jason Kendall. He definitely had a shot at Konerko on this on this wild pitch here. You know, this is another hard curveball that goes down in the dirt, and you see it bounce right back to Kendall's left, and he keeps it out in front of him. But here he throws him down on the side, and when he throws down on the side, he gets under this ball, and the ball goes straight up in the air. And Michael Beulis does a great job just keeping it on the infield. Inside to Quentin, who isn't afraid of getting hit. He's been plunked 17 times this year and is tied for the most in the league. Yeah, as much as he gets hit, you don't see him with all that body armor. He, he just 
nothing on his elbows. He just goes up there and says, I'm, I'm going to be tough. <laughs> Grounded to short, so Canerco will stay put. And Betancourt throws out Quinton. One out. Tonight's copyrighted telecast is presented by the authority of the Kansas City Royals. It may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form, and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Kansas City Royals Baseball Corporation. Ryan Lefevre along with Frank White and Joel Goldberg with producer Kevin Shank, director Steve Kurtenbach, associate producers Al Broughton and Sam Abramson, and the producer of Royals Live is T.J. McGinnis. Fouled away by Mark Tien. He is 0 for 2 so far. And speaking of Joel. That's the intro? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Mark Tien, you mentioned Ryan at the plate. And you were talking before about the difference for him being in a race now. And, and he said it's different because this time of year, not that guys are trying any harder or any less, but you've got the, the grind and maybe the dog days of August that come up. And he said, you just don't think about that right now. He said that when you're on a team that's competing, you come every single day. It's just a different perspective. The other thing that's different for him is he's fighting for playing time now, having missed two and a half months with the finger injury. And he said that, you know, it's pretty tough to complain about that at this point because the team played so well when he was gone that now you see him DHing a couple of times and he said what's really been different is since he's come back in the last week when he's gone to third Omar Vizquel has come in as a late inning defensive replacement when he has played in the outfield Andrew Jones has come in as a late inning replacement not that Mark Tien is you know lacking in his defense but you've got some guys that have won a lot of gold gloves in their career and the White Sox doing anything they can to win at this point he is enjoying it though guys well, those two you just named have won 21 gold gloves between them. Well, I think it's a character-building time for uh, Mark Tien also, and he's a great team guy. And, and I think that when you get injured and you're in a pennant race and someone steps in and the team continues to roll, managers aren't as apt to change those things until it dictates that he has to change them. So as long as they're winning, I think he, he's just going to stay with that formula. Yeah, Ozzy again is fortunate that – this particular player who lost his job going on the disabled happens to be Mark Tien. Yes, yes. You know, it also helps, and we know Mark Tien, he's not going to gripe about anything, kind of like a David DeJesus in the sense that he's going to come to work, he's going to do his job, but maybe there's a difference if he doesn't have that multi-year contract in the sense that he's got to try to prove something for next year. And again, he's not going to say anything, but here's a guy right now in Mark Tien that signed the long-term deal, got the three-year deal when he went over to Chicago. So he can look long-term at this, do what he needs to do for the team right now. Down on strikes for the second time looking. And Umber has six. Yeah, too close to take here. This is this is the ball that's right on the uh, bottom half of the strike zone, running away from Mark. And he just kind of gave up on this one, Ryan. He just, he went, he good, everything was good. He just brought his hands in and couldn't swing. And the ball, the ball the strike is too close to take with two strikes. And having watched him play so many times as a Royal, that's his pitch, down and out over the plate. And that's the ball he drives the left center field when he's right. Uh, everything's going well for him. But I think, it, you know, Joel said all, a lot of great things about Mark. And I think, I think even though he would probably want more playing time, but the beauty of where he's at now is that he is in a pennant race. And as, as that race gets better and tighter going down the wire, it didn't matter who gets the job done as long as somebody gets it done. You just want to win at this point. And you deal with the other stuff, you know, next year. So Canerco at second base with two outs. And Ramirez takes a big swing and misses. Canerco was at second base with nobody out. Well, Quinn didn't do a good job getting him over to third base. And uh, Umber was able to come back and help himself, you know, with, with getting Quinn to ground the ball to shortstop and striking out Mark Tien. And he gets away with a hanging curveball right there, mainly because it was away from Ramirez. But he's also picked this game up since we saw him last. Still batting him down in the order, hitting 291. 0 for 2 tonight, but before tonight had hit in 13 consecutive games. Lined into center field. Canerco does not run well, and Jeff Cox is going to hold him at third base. 
And that was a good decision for the White Sox as Blanco makes a good low throw. But normally a Ramirez would see a, a breaking ball in this situation, try to get a fastball by him and, and a nice hard single to center field. And you're right, most most teams would send that guy out and say, oh, it's two out. So I, I just took a chance, but that's a smart play by Jeff Cox at third base. 96 pitches for Umber. He had not pitched before tonight in 10 days. And that was at the Angels, and he threw just 29 pitches. So he's been starting most of the year at Triple A. Ned Yost has the bullpen ready, but just wants to go out and hear what Umber has to say before going after A.J. Pierzynski. Jesse Chavez is warmed up, just standing and waiting for the call. And Ned Yost will leave him in there. We will answer tonight's AT&T trivia question. Who is the White Sox single season home runs leader? Do you know who it is, Frank? You said his name. You said his name earlier tonight. Well, I, I forget now. Al likes Paul Canarco. Albert Bell. Oh, my, you're right. Yeah, I, I told you. I said, you're not going to remember him with the White Sox. So when I opened up the record book to look at it. I didn't even never would have thought about Albert Bell in a million years. <laughs> I thought Al might just Kernerkel's one of his favorite favorite guys. I thought Paul might be the guy. He is. Then I did sixth all time. I did mention Jermaine Die. I did say his name between us. Pierzynski tried to lay down a bunt. Albert Bell playing with the White Sox. Remember that was big news and had the umpire or the uh, owners rather griping at one another. It was right after the strike and all the umpires were talking about being more financially responsible. And what does Jerry Reinsdorf do shortly after the strike? He signs Albert Bell to a five year fifty five million dollar contract. Which was out of this world at the time. Shot past Betamete and up the left field line. The White Sox take a three to one lead. Ramirez goes to third, and as the throw goes to third, Pierzynski, who always seems to be heads up in the game, he goes to second. Oh, AJ does a good job staying with this curveball here, Ryan. And this ball just didn't come in at all. Just floated out there, just sort of backed up out over the plate, and he stayed right with it, hit it right inside the bag at third base. Alex does a good job going over to make this play, but Unieski, if he gets between second and third and on the grass, and Alex can make that throw right to him, and, and he might be able to prevent uh, AJ from going to second base. Now, Jason Kendall calls timeout. And goes out to have a word with Umber. Well, it looked like Ned Yost gave Phil Umber a chance to talk his way into the game and not be removed with Jesse Chavez warming up. Now it appears that way, but Ned also could have just gone out to the mound to give him a chance to catch his breath on a hot night, and now he's at 98 pitches. This is a doubleheader, so you don't want to have to go to the bullpen really early unless you really have to. Well, that's true. And at this point, he really hasn't been hurt that bad. I mean, right there, he just needed to, uh, he's one out away from getting out of this, but he's going to have to work himself through it. And I think the big, you hit it right on the head. That's the double header. That's the big thing. And you go to bullpen too early, have to go through too many guys to get through this game, then you got to sweat through the second game. Fouled away by Beckham, one ball, one strike. So Umber right at 100 pitches. No walks, so he's had good control. He has struck out six, and he's given up three runs, eight hits, a single run in each of the last three innings. And that's into center field, and now the White Sox are going to have a three-run sixth inning and a five-to-one lead. So probably because of the doubleheader, Ned Yost leaves Umber in there after the base hit from Ramirez. And the next two guys 
that Umber faces, they combine to drive in three. Right, right, you're right, Brian. I tell you, it's kind of bad. He pitched a great game up at, at a spot start situation, but to be able to have to stay out there and, and, and face Beckham in that situation and, and give up the lead, and that, that, that is, uh, I mean, just to have him expand the lead on you, then that is tough. Now, right after the base hit from Pierzynski, Dusty Hughes started warming up right away. I mean, looks like he only got a few warm-up tosses. When Ned Yost went to the mound, he first signaled with his right hand, so Dusty wanted to make sure that it was him, and now he signals with the left hand. So the Chevy call to the bullpen brings in Dusty Hughes. Why not? to one in the top of the sixth inning. Let's take a look at tonight's Cabot Woodstain legendary performance. And back on August the 21st of 1985, the Royals beat the White Sox two to one here at then Royal Stadium. George Brett with a go ahead home run in the fourth. And when that season ended, it was a big year for the Royals as they won the World Series. And it was a big year for Ozzie Guillen. He was the American League Rookie of the Year. As Frank will remember vividly, after that two to one win, some 25 years ago over the White Sox, you guys were just a game and a half back. Vividly? But I didn't need to tell you that. You remembered. <laughs> Betancourt charges. This time he gets Juan Pierre. That ends the inning, but the White Sox come up with three.
5-1 Chicago. The Royals have Unievsky, Betancourt, Gregor Blanco, and Jason Kendall in the bottom of the sixth inning. Chicago just scored three to pad their lead. Uni goes after the first pitch after being very patient his first time up. And it is called an out in transition. After Ramirez made the catch, he tried to quickly shift it over to his hand. The ball dropped. That's what the fans are reacting to. But the umpires say this is a catch, which it is. I agree. And now Gregor Blanco. And he lays down a bunt and bunts it foul. Pierzynski plays it anyway. I think 80s want to show him that I can get to it and still get a throw down the second base, down the first base, and let you know so you won't think he can bunt and beat him. He doesn't get out behind that plate very quickly. Royals look like they had. Garcia on the ropes, even though at the time it was just a two to one game after Betamit's home run in the fifth inning. But Gordon lined out to second, Bloomquist lined out to deep left. And as you pointed out, Frank, he was hitting the ball up. But he was able to strike out Avilas to get out of the fifth. And then the White Sox reward him with three in the next half inning. So he has a chance to. Catch his breath on a hot night in between innings. Cool down. Pitch a little more comfortably now, ahead by four. Well, Humber was in a situation, Ryan, where he spots starting uh, because of last night's rain out, and you know he gets you into the fifth inning uh, in good shape. And you kind of you kind of hate to see him leave on that type of note when he spots starting for the club. And like I said, on a normal game, you know maybe he's he's out of there. But with the double header, they they go a little bit longer with him and try to get him through that inning. But you, you just hate to see a, a good a good spot start outing like that, you know, come to come to that one inning. Up the middle, and Beckham picks it off, and Blanco is out number two. White Sox know already that Minnesota has lost. So if they can hang on here in game one, they would be three and a half back of the Twins with another game to play tonight. Brian Bullington will pitch game two. And at least when this game started, the White Sox still hadn't announced who was going to pitch for them in the second game. So it could be that Ozzie Guillen is going to leave his options open because whoever he has in mind for game two, he might have to use in this game. Probably doesn't have to use him now. And Freddie Garcia has gotten two outs of the sixth inning, but you never know if we go extra innings or if Garcia was going to come out early, he maybe needed to burn that arm. Well, it's all about winning game one. You know, you win game one, then you start thinking about game two. And, and that, if you try to think about game two before you win game one, then you really get yourself in a pickle. And I, I, I agree with the way he's going about it right now. There's Edwin Jackson slamming his water bottle up against the railing. He was going to start last night. Well, he did start last night. He walked Gregor Blanco and then was one ball, one strike on Jason Kendall when the heavy rain arrived. Well, both pitchers wanted to come back tonight. O'Sullivan said he'd come back if they wanted him to come back. Jackson said he wanted to come back and pitch. But but I think it's better to just wait and uh, maybe in, in relief maybe tomorrow. One of those guys have to get in. Maybe you can do it there. But, but I don't think it hurts those guys to wait until their next turn. Well, Sullivan still looking for his first win as a Royal. Edwin Jackson lost his last four with Arizona before the trade, but in three starts with the White Sox, his ERA is 1.35, adding to an already strong starting rotation. Kendall hits it off of Vizquel's glove, and he will reach with two outs. And Kendall gets a single. He is one out of three. 
It's a changeup here, Ryan. The changeup goes down and in. Kendall stays with it, hits it right down the line. Vizquel goes over. I, th I really believe even if he catches his ball, he, he probably won't have a play at first base. That ball really got, got by him. He wouldn't have been able to get his feet set enough to get enough on that throw to get it across the diamond. And that brings up Keila Kaihue, who is batting third for the first time this year. And he takes a strike from Garcia. Keila grounded into a double play in the first inning and then grounded sharply to second in the fourth. Ned Yost explaining that Keila is batting third because he's trying to break up the right-handers and the left-handers, countering the White Sox bringing in left-hander Matt Thornton late in the game. Well, Jason Kendall, you guys covered it a few games ago on first base, a walk and lead off first base. I asked him uh, yesterday, he said John Wathen taught him to walk and lead. He said, never heard that before. And, and he said, as long as I get out there and the pitcher doesn't stop me and I keep moving, I just right into my right into my stride, full stride right away. There's Duke. And Duke does some, he teaches base running in spring training and goes to the minor league affiliates and, and also teach base running down there. So he, he's got, a, he's got a, a, a job title that's pretty long. Well, Kendall won't steal second, but he'll get there anyway on a wild pitch. Two balls and two strikes on Keela. Duke was explaining some interesting details to us yesterday before the game. When he set the Royals record for grounding into a double play in 1982, and Billy is tied at this homestand, he missed a month of that season. That was also the same year that he stole 36 bases, which is a major league record for a catcher. And he also explained in that year, there was a lot going on for him in 82, that he had a 91-game errorless streak at first base, as he would move around quite a bit. And he lost that streak in 1982 Losing a ground ball in the sun. Figure that one out. <laughs> we'll explain later as Keela bounces to second and the Royals are scoreless in the sixth inning. Possible with the nation's fastest mobile broadband network. AT&T Rethink Possible. And by Thoroughbred Ford. They'll trade for your old truck and get you into a new F-150 for less at Thoroughbred Ford. Now those two shots will help explain how John Wathen lost a ground ball in the sun. The sun very low, just above the horizon for maybe a 7 o'clock game, or back then you guys would play some 7.30 games. And we showed you an exterior shot of Kauffman Stadium, and that's on the other side of third base and left field. 
and the little openings in the ballpark where fans can come in from the concourse to their seats that the correct term is a vomitory and we pointed out before how the sun when it's low as it is now will shine through these areas and John Waffen was at first base and I believe if I have the details of the play correct he was holding a runner at first so the sun was low it was coming in low through the stadium he turned quickly to field a ground ball never saw it went right through his legs and that's how he lost a 91 game airless streak at first on a ground ball that he lost in the sun isn't it amazing how when we start talking about guys and get them on TV and next thing you know they got a cell phone on the air? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody at home, <laughs> Nancy's probably calling us in, John, they're talking about you. <laughs> and by the look on Duke's face, Duke is saying, now what are those guys saying about me? <laughs> they didn't say he runs well for a catcher, I know. <laughs> Chopped to short. Going to have to hurry. Out at second base. Didn't get Rios. So Vizquel is out at second base. And Rios safe at first. He is 0 for 4. That's a high hopper from Rios here. Unieski had to wait there. And this is where he got to get that good quick transfer. And they didn't, and they didn't get it out of Vilas right there. And he beat the throw to first base. Dusty Hughes came on with two outs in the sixth inning and got Juan Pierre. And now is allowed to walk and has gotten an out on a fielder's choice in the seventh and throws a strike to Paul Canerco. Canerco started the three run six with a single, scored on Pierzynski's two run base hit. And then Ramirez and Pierzynski coming home on Beckham's base hit. White Sox have the second best average in the American League with runners in scoring position. Rios didn't have a very big lead, but he has stolen 24 bases. Two balls and one strike. Remember last year when the White Sox picked up Alex Rios off of waivers from the Blue Jays and they assumed that mega contract over $60 million. That looks like a pretty good deal right now for Chicago. He's working on one of his better seasons. High in the air to left field. And Alex is back. And gets onto the warning track to make the catch. Rios had gone all the way to second base, but has plenty of time to return. So Canerco just missed his 32nd home run of the year. And there are two down. And Royals baseball is brought to you by Thoroughbred Ford. They'll trade for your old truck and get you into a new F-150 for less. Right now at Thoroughbred Ford. I think that's what makes uh, trades and and general managers that take a flyer on players. They they see him play, they see the athletic ability, and they see the good year. And then they take advantage of it by going out and get them, and the guy plays well for them. White Sox get a leadoff walk, but they're scoreless in the seventh inning.
watching tonight a doubleheader. Here's tonight's in-game box score presented by Mass Mutual. Royals have four hits, one run in six innings against Freddie Garcia. Wilson Betamich sold a home run, made it a two-run game in the bottom of the fifth. And then Chicago scored three in the sixth. Billy Butler, Wilson Betamich, and Alex Gordon in the seventh inning. Splitter that just disappeared on Butler. Billy is grounded out to third and flied out to right. Well, this is what makes Freddie Garcia so tough. You just don't know what he's going to throw you. I mean, the bottom dropped out of that splitter, and then he got the change up. He's got the varying speeds on his fastball. He's just a hard guy to center unless he's up in his own. And if he gets up in his own, the ball he hits hard, but he just stays down. It's hard to get a read on those. Billy had been five out of nine against Garcia with three doubles. Stayed up at 72 miles an hour, two balls, two strikes. Garcia really using his defense in six innings. He has only walked one and he has only struck out two. Still two balls, two strikes. Garcia going for his 11th win of the year. He did not swing three and two. Garcia is also trying for his 132nd career win and that's significant because for the time being it would tie him with Johan Santana for the most wins by a pitcher from Venezuela. Do it again. Crowd reacting to a nice catch just below us and to our right. That's a great catch. Wow, that's a one hand job. He, he didn't there. even catch it in the palm, too. He caught it with his fingertips. Billy, after a few foul balls, takes a walk, and that's Garcia's second. That Taco Bell shows this ball is down at the bottom of the zone, and and Freddie Garcia really wanted this. And you know that we got to remind the fans that that grid is at the front of the plate, so when it goes through there, it and then gets to the catcher's glove, it could appear lower than it really is. Garcia has not yet reached 90 pitches, so not only has he pitched well, he has been pitch efficient, and something. He certainly wants to do on a hot night. And this is nothing new for him this year. He's only been averaging about 91 pitches per start this season. And just by watching the fastball velocity and the radar gun at Kauffman Stadium may or may not be hot. We don't know. Some people claim that it is, but. I haven't seen much more than 90 or 91 miles an hour from Garcia, so he doesn't throw like he did in his first stint with the White Sox, more of an off-speed control type pitcher, just trying to keep the Royals off balance, and he's done that. As Betamid launches it again in the right field corner, but foul, he was able to straighten one out, leading off the bottom of the fifth inning. That's a changeup up in the zone, and he stayed back and just Got the hands through this ball really well, and this ball went out pretty not not easily, but in this ballpark, anything that gets over the fence is a long way, and you're just lucky to get it out of here. But good pitch up out of the zone that he took advantage of. Garcia was one of the premier pitchers in the American League. He was with the Seattle Mariners and traded to the White Sox and he had a span of six years in a row where he threw at least 200 pitches. He was in the White Sox rotation when they won the World Series in 2005. 
after 2006. He was traded to the Phillies and then had surgery on his shoulder. Good pitch down and in to strike out Betamit and Garcia has his third strikeout. We've seen this a lot, you know, Taco Bell brings us Fox tracks. We've seen it a lot, right handers going down underneath the swing. This is a split finger that acts almost like a slider. It goes down underneath the, the Wilson Batamid swing, and that's how he got the strikeout. Sergio Santos just starting to loosen up. Garcia's now thrown 91 pitches, and he gets Alex Gordon with one on, one out. In his last year before being traded, Freddy Garcia went 17 and 9 and went to the Phillies and went 1 and 5 in 11 games. Surgery on his shoulder. And then hits in just three big league games with the Tigers in 2008. And then for the White Sox, only nine games. So it took him a while to recover from that shoulder surgery. And he was somewhat of a long shot. Not an extreme long shot, but he was going up against a young pitcher named Daniel Hudson, who is regarded as the White Sox number one pitching prospect in spring training. Garcia won that. And as it turned out, the White Sox traded Daniel Hudson to the Diamondbacks to get Edwin Jackson. Alex going for it all, missed. Two balls, two strikes. Well, this really seems to be the area that Freddie Garcia wants to go. It's a nice little slaughter that went underneath Alex Swing and the pitch before he got put some better meat on a split finger that had the same action. Now three balls, two strikes. Alex can't get the ball past Gordon Beckham at second base. Get a sharp one hopper to Beckham and he's lined out to Beckham. And this time he strikes out. Four for Garcia, two down, and back to Joel Goldberg. Well, Ryan, a couple of updates for you. you know, there were certainly some rumblings before the game that the White Sox might go with Tony Pena, and that is what they're going to do. He's listed right now as the starting pitcher for this game. Ozzy saying as he comes out to the mound, I'd rather lose a game than lose a pitcher, referring to Edwin Jackson. Don't think we'll see Sean O'Sullivan in relief tonight. Probably not tomorrow, although Nevios did say that if he needed Sean O'Sullivan tomorrow for an inning or two, he could. Otherwise, just keep him on the normal rotation schedule we would see O'Sullivan next Wednesday but Edwin Jackson may be wanting to come out there same as O'Sullivan but both managers one in a race one not in a race wanting to be careful with their starting pitchers here tonight guys all right thank you Joel so Brian Bullington and Tony Pena not to be confused with Tony Pena or Tony Pena Junior. <laughs> Ozzy Guillen out to check on Freddie Garcia, who's at 97 pitches. Garcia said he was fine, but Willie Bloomquist on the next pitch singles to right field. So Willie is one for three, and the Royals have two on for Mike Avilas. But right now, I think it can kind of eliminate the fastball from Freddie Garcia. He's just not throwing any. Everything is all speed. It's either the changeup or the split finger, or just maybe a variation of his fastball. But he's not, he's not really throwing any fastball. So the raw hitters are just sort of waiting on that off-speed pitch. And every now and then, he, he throws that good one down in and, and gets a strikeout. But anytime he's up with it, it gets hit. Now Mike Avilas into left field. Butler to third. Eddie Rodriguez will hold him. So they're loaded up for Unievsky Betancourt. And now there is nothing Freddie Garcia can do to stay in the game. Well, I think everything's just been up, you know, and I think that's what and when he gets the two strikes, he, he seems to be able to get the ball down underneath the left hander swing, but the right hander, both those pitch to uh, Bloomquist and Avilas rough in the zone. 
Chevy call to the bullpen. It's Sergio Santos in to face Betancourt. pitcher manager relationship and for a couple of more batters Garcia was able to talk his way to staying in the game but after giving up two hits he is out and Sergio Santos is in Chevy call to the bullpen and Santos with the White Sox ahead by four will face the tying run because the Royals have the bases loaded and Unievsky Betancourt coming up and Uni has two grand slams this year. You got one shortstop at the plate, and you got an ex shortstop on the mound, and, and that's kind of interesting to see uh, this situation here. I remember Santos in Double A when we played against them when when they were down in El Paso with the Diamondbacks. Bencourt lays off the slider. Uni's first grand slam was in May at Boston. Hit it off of Tim Wakefield, got a knuckleball over the Green Monster, and then against Oakland's Trevor Cahill in July here at Coffin Stadium, hit it into the left field bullpen. Butler at third, Bloomquist at second, Avilas at first. And Uni drives it into left center, deep. Back goes Pierre, it is gone! He did it again! Unieski Bentoncourt ties the game and becomes the second Royal in history to have three grand slams in one season. And that's enough for a curtain call. Well, it's, that's an awesome way to do it, Ryan. I tell you, that's why I like the way he, he approaches hitting. You leave the ball middle in his zone. He doesn't try to get a single. He tries to, to really turn on this ball, and he does a good job of it. And early in the count like that, be aggressive, try to drive the ball. And he drives his grand slam out of the ballpark. So that gets the Royals and their fans back into the game. It just absolutely deflates the White Sox. Well, just look at what his ball was. I mean, it's right in his wheelhouse. But, I mean, you can just see it right there. I mean, he knew right away that he got this ball. Santos strikes out Blanco, but it's one hitter too late. The Royals get a grand slam from Unievsky Betancourt, and they have tied the game at five.
game at five. So the White Sox had a four run lead getting into the later innings. And now we're all tied up in game one of a doubleheader. The White Sox already know that Minnesota has lost today. So four games back with a chance to make it a three and a half game deficit if they could win game one and all of a sudden that's not going to be as easy as it looked an inning ago. Dusty Hughes has been in there since the sixth inning. They'll get Mark Tien, Alexi Ramirez, and A.J. Pierzynski. So Phil Umber is off the hook. He gave up five runs, nine hits, and five and two-thirds, making his first start since 2007 at the big league level. Dusty got the final out for him in the sixth and worked around a leadoff walk in the seventh. Tian lines it to left, right at Alex Gordon. He may have lost it for a moment in the lights, but hung in long enough to make the catch. Let's check that American League scoreboard presented by Panera Bread. Detroit, well, they're 12 games back, but trying to hang in there. Leading Cleveland, Boston, six and a half back in the east. They're tied with Toronto. Tampa Bay and Oakland just underway on the west coast. Tampa Bay. One game back of the Yankees. Make that a game and a half as the Yankees beat Seattle. Minnesota scored three in the bottom of the first to lead 3 nothing. Didn't score again. The Angels scored nine. And it was Baltimore over Texas. So the Angels are still breathing in the West. They're seven games back. That's well, kind of nice to hear the crowd still buzzing after that grand slam. I I, I would imagine next time Unieski comes up, he might get a standing ovation. <laughs> well, he got a curtain call. That doesn't happen very often That's, around here. You're right, not very often at all. And they gave him another ovation when he came running out of the dugout when the inning was over to head back to shortstop. I think that's one of the things that uh, Kevin Seitzer wanted to talk about with his hitters is, you know, if you get a, if you get your pitch in your zone. And that's the first pitch. I mean, it was the first pitch, second pitch. Then you, if you hit it solid, then that's a quality at bat. And Unieski, from the middle end, uh, anywhere from the belt to the knees, he's a dangerous hitter with a fastball. And you can get him out of way, but you're not going to sneak the fastball by him in that zone. Royals had Avilas pulled to the middle, and that was a good move because Ramirez hits it right to him. So Ramirez, who extended his hitting streak to 14 games in the sixth inning, is now one for four. Well, Hilsey does a good job. He throws his curveball to the outside, and Ramirez stays with it, thinking he's going to go the other way. And Mike was really fortunate to catch this ball. Didn't quite get in front of it, and, and uh, but he made it go in his glove, and it almost got him off balance a little bit. A.J. Pierzynski. Two hits for him tonight. Two runs scored. He's driven in a run. Entered the game batting 243 overall, but against the Royals, 350, and he's added to that tonight with two hits. Sounds a lot like last year when he hit 400 against the Royals. Just missed down and away. Uh, Dusty went down uh, sidearm to Pazinski to get the ball to the other side of the plate to try to hold him back and off that pitch and just missed off the outside corner. That one is in the strike zone. Two balls, two strikes. Pazinski had a very good year last year and one year ago today. His batting average was at 311. He had seven more home runs. He has more RBIs now than he did last year. So all in all, maybe it isn't a huge drop off for him. Did not see that pitch at all. Hughes strikes him out. And we go to the bottom of the eighth, tied at five.
and Brian Love stepping in for Morgan Kramer on the left field camera. He and his wife Janine won the broadcast experience in the charity auction. Morgan, go take some time off. It's a long night. Of course, after the first game, Morgan's just going to hang. Boulevard Royals live with Jeff Montgomery and myself. We'll break down this game, preview the next game as Brian Bullington will get the start against Tony Pena. And then just like that, we will have game two for you. Busy night here at Kauffman Stadium. Guys, let's go back to you. All right. Thank you, Joel. Go get him, Brian. <laughs> and there's Janine with her camera. Into left field, Jason Kendall with his second hit tonight. So in a tie game in the bottom of the eighth, the Royals have the leadoff man on. So right away, Brian Love is tested. First pitch coming right his way. That's his camera shot. Tremendous skill involved there, and he comes through. Came through. How did he know that that ball was going to be hit right there? I mean, I guess some guys just have it. When it's your night. Yeah. It's your night all the way. <laughs> As Kevin Shanks say, the ball will always find you. <laughs> so that doesn't just apply to a bad defensive player who can hit. The manager will try and sneak him somewhere on the field. The ball will find you. It also applies to it just a seems, rookie it, cameraman. It just seems to know when you're a rookie. That's his shot, too, with Kendall and Canerco at first base. There's nothing to it. We need to try it from up here. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll borrow Swanee's camera. Yeah. Keela's 0 for 3 so far tonight. Had two balls, no strikes against Santos. Keela now 0 for his last 10, batting third for the first time this year. One of the reasons to counteract the White Sox bullpen and bunching up right-handed batters and left-handed batters together, spacing them out, which has kind of been a two-part process in the recent history of the game. Tony La Russa, when he was with the A's, kind of started the situational reliever, bringing in relievers out of the bullpen to face one or two guys just because of the matchup. And then when other teams started to follow, if managers could do it, they would counter that by putting their lineups together, right-handed batter, left-handed batter, right-handed batter, left-handed batter. Keela lifts it to left field, and Juan Pierre makes the play, one down. So that if you have a very good left-handed reliever like Matt Thornton with the White Sox, well, you don't get stuck with him being able to come in and face two or three hitters. You might get one lefty, but before he gets to the next one, he might have to face a righty in between. Well, you have to feel comfortable when you make that lineup that you got guys that can score runs early and have, have a big enough lead. You don't have to deal with Matt Thornton. So you got to also make sure that the guys that you're going alternating with or good, or good RBI guys, guys that are having good years. Santos is outside to Billy Butler. Billy is 0 for 2, but he walked, leading off the seventh inning. And then Freddie Garcia struck out Betamit and Gordon. It looked like it would be an easy inning for him. But then Bloomquist singled right after. Freddie Garcia convinced Ozzie Guillen that he could stay in the game. Then Mike Avila singled. Santos came on and gave up the grand slam to Betancourt. So both times tonight that a manager has gone out to the mound with the option of making a move, both times a manager stayed with the starter. And on both occasions, the starter gave up back-to-back -back hits Kendall runs and Billy fouls it away back to Ryan loves camera shot in left field see kind of widen the shot there so you get a good look at Kendall going to second base he's a quick study 
<laughs> Brian and Janine from Garden City, Kansas. Still one ball, two strikes, and glad that they were able to come back tonight. They had arranged for the broadcast experience for last night's game, but less than one inning into the game, we were rained out. Janine was G Love, if you were watching that night during the broadcast auction, and that was a gift to Brian, a surprise gift. So Brian's real excited. Uh, he's really enjoying this. I don't think she could have done, gotten him a better gift than what she got him because he's he's thoroughly enjoying being in the booth, the cameras, the truck, and uh, we get him out there with Joel and and rivals after this game. He'll enjoy that too. <laughs> Maybe Billy could hit a home run to that little sonic area uh, in straightaway left field. You you might have to carry him out. Yeah. He'd, be, he'd be way too excited, I think. Kendall runs again, and it's in the dirt, and Jason will have a stolen base. But Jason just gets that walk and lead. You know, Santos never makes him stop. The only thing about the walk and lead from a pitching perspective, you got to make the guy stop. When you don't make him stop, he just keeps drifting and drifting, and your first move, he's off and running. And the good thing about the about the, about the uh, walk and lead, Ryan, is that you don't have to get down. You don't have to worry about crossing over. You basically just walk off the base and keep going. Chop to Ramirez, who looks back. Kendall throws out Butler. So two down. Well, Unievsky Betancourt's grand slam isn't the only home run the Royals have hit tonight. Wilson Betamit went deep in the fifth inning. He went deep. He went deep to right center field, Ryan. And I tell you, if he follows the same script, we show his home run. Then he comes up and hits the home run right here. Well, the White Sox will not allow that to happen. So they know now he's been swinging the bat lately. They're going to put him on. And they're going to make Alex Gordon come up with the hit. Frank mentioned it last inning when Betancourt came to the plate. You had one shortstop throwing to another shortstop. As Frank remembers when Sergio Santos was in the minor leagues as an infielder. He was the Diamondbacks first round pick in 2002. And he spent seven years in the minor leagues as an infielder in the Diamondbacks and White Sox system. And then last year he was moved to the mound. And he made the big leagues this year. So he fell right at home on the mound. Only needed one year in the minor leagues to figure out pitching and made the White Sox opening day roster this season. It doesn't usually happen that fast, but for him to be not only in the big leagues that fast, but be pitching in a pennant race in key situations, that, that's got to not only be good for him in the, from a development standpoint, but He's got to look back at that decision and whoever suggested that decision for him to switch from shortstop to pitcher. So two on two out. Alex has not faced Santos yet. He was 0 for 3 against Freddy Garcia. Ball one high and away. Change up. Alex laid off at one ball, one strike. Now that pitch right there, Ryan, is why it's so tough to hit in the major leagues. You, you're in a fastball count, and you throw a change up in a fastball count for a strike. So they take you to school up here, and you really got to be able to make those adjustments really fast. And now over the inside, so he's ahead, one ball, two strikes. And then Fox tracks right here, and he shows it down. Not not his best fastball, like, like a good hard changeup, 
It just goes right at Alex. Alex gives up on it. The ball rolls, moves back out on the inside corner. Got him to chase a slider in the dirt. Jerzinski throws down. So the strikeout is complete. The Royals are scoreless in the eighth, and we are tied at five on our way to the ninth inning. But what we do know is that Unieski Betancourt is responsible for the Chevrolet play of the game. Yeah, all the way, Ryan. It's with, with the Royals down by four, he comes up with his big grand slam. Off Sergio Santos, left center field. Third grand slam of the season. And there you go. One of the few curtain calls of the year. And it'll be Joaquin Sori in the ninth inning. Gordon Beckham, the number nine hitter. Juan Pierre and Omar Vizquel coming up. So a non-save situation for Soria. And remember, he is working on a streak of 28 consecutive saves, which is a new team record. Beckham hit a two-run single in the White Sox three-run sixth, and that made it a five-to-one game. And then when the Royals got the grand slam in the bottom of the seventh, that inning started with a runner at first and two outs. Freddie Garcia had just struck out two hitters in a row. But then a single from Bloomquist, a single from Avilas, the pitching change, and Betancourt ties it with a slam. No swing. Corey Blazer is the umpire at first base. So a fill in for Rob Drake, who should be at first base, but Drake will work the plate in game two. So in a double header, they will save the home plate umpire for game two and allow him to rest for the first game and then Dan Bellino most likely who's working the plate for this game will not be part of the umpiring crew for the second game. Is that new? I'd say over the last four or five years. Beckham just got a piece and hit it off of Kendall's glove. Can't play two I guess. <laughs> Soria has saved the last eight wins for the Royals. Chop to Betancourt. Beckham is out number one. Remember the Royals had that string of close games. 
They had seven consecutive wins of just one run. Not seven in a row, but their last seven wins prior to winning on Wednesday against Cleveland were all one run games. Two to one, one to nothing, four three, two one, three two, five four, and four to three going back to the last day in July. A little bit low to Juan Pierre. He has two hits. He has driven in a run. He has stolen a base. He has scored a run. And he's made a very nice play in left field. Taking an extra base hit away from Willie Bloomquist in the fifth inning. Pierre is hit in nine straight games and is batting 279. Nice play by Soria and throws out Pierre. This ball is definitely headed for center field and that'd be a tough play up the middle for any second baseman to make. Joaquin does a great job reaching back across his body and stopping this ball, keeping his balance and making a nice throw to first to get Pierre. So two down and nobody on to Omar Vizquel. He has two hits. He has an RBI and he has reached with a walk. And Omar Vizquel has never faced Joaquin Soria. Right down the middle, one ball, one strike. Royals bullpen has now faced 10 batters beginning with Dusty Hughes with two outs in the sixth inning, and they have retired nine. Dusty Hughes. Gave up a walk to Vizquel leading off the seventh inning and then retired or at least got an out against the next six. And now Soria has retired the first two in the ninth. Slow curve is poked into left field for a base hit. A three hit game for Omar Vizquel. Well, with, with two strikes, Vizquel's going to cut his swing down right, and this curveball just stayed up. It didn't come down at all, and Vizquel didn't do anything but just try to swat it to left field. Just all hands right there, just serving it out there. And that's what happens when those breaking balls stay up out of, out of the plate, especially with two strikes. And Vizquel will run as Rios takes strike one. Rios is 0 for 4. With a couple of strikeouts, those were against Phil Umber. Six stolen bases for Vizquel. He's been thrown out four times. So it's not a big number by any stretch, but this is someone who hasn't been playing every day. Not running, and Rios fouls it away. No balls and two strikes. Rios is one out of four in the past against Soria, including a walk. Now Vizquel runs. The pitch is outside, and Kendall gets him by a mile. So we go to the bottom of the ninth inning, tied at five. Willie Bloomquist will lead off. Mike Avilas will follow. They help set up Betancourt's grand slam in the seventh.
fifth in a tie game. Sergio Santos still in there. He gave up the grand slam to Unievsky Bedencourt that tied the game at five. Willie Bloomquist pops up the first pitch. And it's Beckham right near the bag at second base. Willie is one for four. Santos inherited the bases loaded and two outs in the seventh inning. And trying to jump ahead of Unievsky Betancourt. Uni hit a line drive home run over the wall in left center field. Santos pitched a scoreless eighth, giving up a single and a walk. And now Avilas lays down a bunt, but right to the former infielder. And that's an easy play for him. And Avilas is two out of four. And now Unievsky Betancourt. So Uni got us to this point. And now has a chance to get us ready for game two of the doubleheader. Well, Uni has to send out 13 home runs, Ryan, and uh, 59 RBI. For a guy who hits back in the back of the order for the most part of this year, you have to go back and you have to think he's got some really big hits for the Rawls to get the, that, that number of RBI. That was just his second at bat ever against Santos, so he's one for two against him. There's the power change, but that stayed up. That was that was straight, you know, straight as a string right there. And that, that pitch there, that that, that at that velocity will get hit. You know, you're running away from your fastball, your fastball gets hit for a grand slam, you run away from it, and that, that's always going to be your best pitch. Hit to left field, and that is a fair ball down into the corner, and the Royals will have the winning run at second base. So Betancourt has another extra base hit and his 24th double of the year. But again, Santos has gone away from his fastball. He went with it. But another off-speed pitch, and Unieski was sitting there. The ball's middle in, belt high, and he's always going to have a chance to hit that ball hard and get him a base hit. So he didn't get the home run, but Uni is safe at second base. Safe and secure. New York life. And now Santos. And it'll be Chris Sale, a lefty. Coming on to face Gregor Blanco. Remember after the game, it's Boulevard Royals Live with Joel and Monty from Rivals. And then game two with Brian Bullington starting for the Royals and Tony Pena for the White Sox. Well, you can say this about the White Sox. If they have a pitcher that they think can help them, it doesn't matter who he is or how long he's been around, they're going to use him. And this is Chris Sale. 
He was the White Sox first round pick this year. So earlier this spring, he was playing college ball at Florida Gulf Coast University, 13th overall pick, and now pitching in the big leagues, and not just pitching in the big leagues, pitching in a race for the American League Central Division. This is his sixth major league appearance. He has not given up a run yet. And I guess when you're left-handed and you throw at that angle at 99 miles an hour, that's an easy decision. Well, that's funky right there. That's going to wow. Hold, that's going to hold that left-hander in there very tight, and he's not going to want to go out there, out over the plate, and try to get that ball away. 99 again. Well, you can see Gregor Blanco is very late on that fastball, and uh, now we have to wait to see if he's got a good breaking ball to go with that fastball. We we're just talking about Sergio Santos, who was just removed. He had one year in the minor leagues as a pitcher. After seven years as a minor league infielder, pitched good enough in spring training. The White Sox took him. Three pitches, down goes Blanco, and down go the Royals. So we will go extra innings in game one. Wow. That guy's masked. Holy cow. Grand slam in the bottom of the seventh inning. Extra innings are presented by Jack Link's Beef Jerky all season long. Jack Link's Beef Jerky, field your wild side. So it was going to be a long night anyway, and now the Royals and White Sox will play at least 10 innings. Jesse Chavez will get the Top of the 10th with Alex Rios, Paul Canerco, and Carlos Quinton to the plate. Game was moving along very quickly. The White Sox appeared to be in control with a 5-1 to one lead at the end of six and a half innings. But Unievsky Betancourt turned that all around. Jesse Chavez is the fourth Royals pitcher tonight. And a fastball at 97 for strike one. Yeah, that, that, that home run, that, that grand slam by Unieski Bedencourt, Ryan, you take a team that's feeling pretty comfortable about having this first game in the bag, and, and the grand slam is really the furthest thing from your mind. And when that happens to you, and all those runs come all in on one swing, that's pretty deflating. you got to really get yourself back in the saddle and, and try to get going again. One and two on Rios. And as we mentioned earlier, the White Sox know that Minnesota has already lost. So they're leading 5-1 to one going into the bottom of the seventh inning with two outs and a runner at first. You know, they need to get seven outs. And then they're only down by three and a half games. Rios goes around. Corey Blazer punches him out. One down in the tenth inning. A uh, good hard fastball in the outside corner. But it's, it's way off the plate from, from what I can see by the, by the eye. And it, 
It, it's probably, but now they're probably calling it on the swing. And either one, it's kind of suspect on both of them there. Not only punched him out, but gave it a yeah. Well, the umpires have to practice that yeah. stuff. You know, that don't just come to you. So, like, when they go to the hotel room after the game, get in front of the mirror. Yeah, just like guys take BP, you know, they got to get in front of the mirror and practice their third strike call, their first base check swing call, and their first base third out call at first base, second base call out on the base. They got all those calls. They got different calls for all those different situations. One ball, one strike on Canerco. Corey Blazer, a minor league umpire who, like many others, had a chance to fill in at the big league level and filling in for Rob Drake, who will be behind the plate for game two. Two balls and one strike on Canerco. But don't that make sense, though? If they didn't practice it, then they all do it the same way, right? I could think of a few umpires that might want to practice a little more in front of the mirror. Two balls, two strikes. I could think of one who might want to practice calling strikes so that everyone else in the ballpark knows it's a strike. But anyway, one out, nobody on. And Canerco pulls it foul. White Sox scored all five of their runs off of Phil Umber in five and two-thirds innings. Umber's line doesn't look very good, but he pitched well. I think the Royals are happy with what they got from him and gave up three of the five runs with two outs in the sixth inning. Struck out six and didn't walk anyone. Canerco grounds it to the hole and past Betancourt. That's two hits tonight for Paul Canerco. And Dusty Hughes, two and a third inning scoreless. Joaquim Soria, a scoreless ninth. And Chavez here in the 10th. Well, this is the ball here, Ryan. If Uniesi stays on his feet, he probably can catch this ball, but I think he was trying to catch the ball and, and figure out how he could get to his feet to make the throw at the same time, and, and therefore you don't, you don't make the catch. But he could probably just go run right through the ball and catch it, but the chance of having a play after that is very slim. Brent Lillibridge will run for Canerco. And Carlos Quinton at the plate. Quinton was a one-man wrecking ball when the Royals were in Chicago right before the All-Star break. He had a grand slam in that three-game series. The White Sox hit 10 home runs in that three-game series, but Quinton tonight has flied out twice, grounded out, and struck out. One ball and no strikes from Chavez. White Sox have stolen two bases, and they've been thrown out once. Juan Pierre and A.J. Pierzynski have stolen bases. And Omar Vizquel has been thrown out. Runner going, and that's driven into right center field. Bloomquist cuts it off. Jeff Cox is going to wave him home. A good throw will get him, and he is out at the plate. Boy, Willie Bloomquist made a great play to cut that off, and I thought for sure they would hold the runner. Well, after Lillibridge hesitated at second base, I thought so also, Ryan. But Jeff Cox wanted to force the issue right there, and they got burned at home plate. But we had a good turn at third base. But the throw beat him, and 
Justin Jason Kendall did a great job picking this ball out of the dirt and just didn't have, Little Bridge had nowhere to go at home plate. There's a good turn there, but you can see with Kendall standing there, he picks the ball out of the dirt, and when he does, it takes him out over the plate, and Little Bridge has to try to go around, but there's no place to go. But he almost came to a complete stop at second base and really didn't take off until that ball hit the ground out there in right center field, and that's why I'm surprised that he was sent home. You know, and I said, too, a good throw will get him. That really wasn't a good throw. That was a great save by Jason Kendall. Great save. Uh, Mike did a great job on the one hop to him and getting his body in position to make that throw. And like you say, catching that short hop like that with a catcher's mitt and making a tag is not that easy. But, you know, Willie did a great job just getting over there, cutting this ball off. You know, just got it on one hop. And before he got it, Little Bridge was still standing there at second base trying to see if that's going to be a hit or not. And then he takes off. I say nine out of ten times that ball gets by the catcher. That that, I mean, he's reaching on a short hop with the most difficult glove anyone can wear to handle a short hop. I mean, a catcher's glove is not designed to make plays like that. A first baseman's glove is, but that is a small, thick glove. And not only does he dig it, but he applies the tag. Yeah, just to be able to hold on to it at the end of the glove like that and not have it dislodged by the base runner. It made it even a, a, a greater play on Jason's part. Mark Tian has had a tough night. 0 for 4 with a couple of strikeouts. Had a play. The Royals faced Jesse Chavez last year when he was with the Pirates, but Mark Tian did not face him. So he's facing... Chavez for the first time tonight. I think Jeff Cox, third base coach, Ryan was banking on two good, two good throws, having to get a little bridge at the plate. And in fact, there were there were there weren't there weren't two good throws. Uh, Willie gave Mike Avilas a one hop, and then Mike turned around and gave Kendall a one hop to the plate. And then and uh, the, but the Ross came out on the on the on the good end of that. Normally, one of those guys would have mishandled uh, a, a bouncing ball in that situation. Three balls, two strikes to Tian. So, do you challenge Tian here, or do you go after Alexi Ramirez? I think they want to, I think they'd rather go after Ramirez here, even though he's having a better year. They got first base open and give you a force out on a ground ball. Knee buckling curveball and Tian knew it. So a great play on defense saves the game and we're still tied at five. No, that's hard to do. Unieski Betancourt's grand slam 
and in the field, cutting off this ball, and the Royals cutting off a runner at the plate. You know, the more you watch this play, the, the tougher it really looks. Oh. You know, it's the more amazed that, that he was able to catch this ball. That's a fantastic play. And Kendall leads off in the bottom of the 10th against Chris Sale, who is pitching in college this spring. Taken in the first round by the White Sox. Came on with two outs in the ninth inning. Struck out Gregor Blanco on three pitches, all at 99 miles an hour. It'll be Kendall, and then Jay Miller is on deck. He'll bat for Kila Kaihue, and then Billy Butler. Kendall has two hits and a stolen base. Way out in front. Man, this kid's got some stuff. Oh. So he's phase two, struck out two, using the heat to get the left hand batter Blanco, and then off speed, and he had Kendall all twisted up. Well, that's just a real nice little curveball, Ryan. It just he just comes out that lower arm angle and got a little tight spin in the back door in the outside corner. And now Jay Miller. Kila Kaihue was 0 for 4. And Miller jumps on the first pitch. And Quinton waits for it in right field. Two down in the 10th. And now Billy Butler. 0 for 3 so far. He did walk in the seventh inning, and he, along with Bloomquist and Avila, scored on the Betancourt Grand Slam. One ball and no strikes. A sweeping slider in for a strike. Well, how'd you like to be a left-hand batter digging in against this guy? I mean, he's got... Ankles and knees and elbows flying everywhere, coming down by way of first base, and then he's popping the mid to upper 90s on you. Billy rolls it to third, and Vizquel lobs it over in time, and we'll go to the 11th inning, tied at five.
Link's Beef Jerky, Feed Your Wild Side. Which is appropriate because there has been a wild side to tonight's game. Changes defensively. Jay Miller will stand in right field. That's where Willie Bloomquist was playing. Willie will shift over to third base. And Wilson Bedemi is at first. Jay Miller batting for Kila Kaihue. In the 11th inning with Jesse Chavez still on the mound. It'll be Alexi Ramirez, A.J. Pierzynski, and Gordon Beckham. Drilled foul off the left field line. The White Sox, I'm sure, were already in shock. And that was starting to wear off into the 10th inning. Shocked after Yenievsky Betancourt hit a two-out grand slam in the seventh inning. That turned a 5-1 to one game into a 5-5 five five game. Chopped to Uni. And throws it off the bag, but Betamit helps him out and gets Ramirez for the out. And just as soon as the shock started to wear off, the White Sox figured they had something going in the top of the 10th with a runner at first. Carlos Quinton driving into right center field. And pinch runner Brent Lillibridge was waved around third, trying to score all the way from first base. And the Royals threw him out. From a manager's perspective, he always says, well, what's going to happen next? <laughs> In some terms, you say, well, that's just great. <laughs> <laughs> Pierzynski has two hits, two runs scored, a stolen base, and an RBI. And he's down 0-2 against Chavez. This is Jesse's second inning. Pierzynski is one of the toughest in the American League to strike out. Broke his bat. Betamid is there. And there are two down. And now Gordon Beckham. Beckham is hit in seven straight, and he took care of that with a two-run single in the sixth inning. And that made the score 5-1. The White Sox have not scored since. And that has popped up. Betamit crosses the line, goes back across the line again, and only three come to the plate in the top of the 11th inning. We go to the bottom of the 11th inning. Fox Sports Kansas City presenting this 
Royals Marathon. It's Royals baseball all night and into the morning. <laughs> when we started this run, I was, I was trying to compare it to a round of golf. Where we know you're going to be 18 holes. We're going to be around five, five hours, but I think we're going to go right by that. <laughs> we're going to shoot for 36 holes tonight. <laughs> well, we're going to play more than 36 half innings. That is a guarantee as we're in the bottom of the 11th inning. Wilson Betamete, Alex Gordon, and Willie Bloomquist as Chris Sale stays in. And he has shown off an electric fastball and a big, hard, sweeping slider. He becomes the first player from the 2010 draft to get to the big leagues. White Sox took him out of Florida Gulf Coast University. Well, you talk about deception. He's got it on his fastball, that hard breaking ball, and his changeup. I mean, he just he can get to the outside corner, and the ball holds that holds that line. And they really just, just try to hump up on that one at 97 miles an hour. Two balls and two strikes. We'll take a look at his motion here, Ryan. He really gets coiled good. Then he comes out of there, and and then he brings that arm back. You know, <laughs> after he releases the pitch, most most pitchers leave that arm hanging out there. But once he lets the ball go, he just comes back into his body. Well, you really hope with those mechanics and those arm angles that he doesn't hurt himself. He's uh, he's tall and wiry, and wiry strong. 100 miles an hour. But I mean, with all those elbows coming at you, I mean, it looks like his arm might follow the ball to the plate one of these days. But if he can stay 100 miles an hour on the outside corner, he's not going to get hurt very often. But you like to see him go both sides of the plate with the fastball. And a walk. The most pitches that Chris Sale has thrown this year with the White Sox is 21 in a single outing. And he has thrown 19. And there is no one warming up behind him in the bullpen. Now that's going to be the thing with, with uh, Chris Sale, Ryan, is they, they, can he get the fastball inside to the right hander? Krasinski wanted that ball inside. Again, it, it tells to the outside. So those might be some of the things they have to continue to build as, as he gets more experience in the big leagues. And Alex kept the ball off his lips. Yes, he did. And I'm not sure if he was trying to bunt or just keep the ball off of his lips. Well, I think the intent was to bunt, but the ball, I think the ball came back in on him. He got that lower arm angle. The ball had the tendency to run back in and did it almost like he didn't see it. Now, how badly does he want to dig back in there right now? Not too bad, but. This is this is ball. This is pro ball. You got to get back in there, get the fear out of there, and get yourself set. Good balance. Get you a good pitch. The only thing, but here you got to make sure you, you don't bunt that borderline high fastball at 98. That you're gonna pop that ball up. This is something that Alex is not asked to do very often. Is bunt. So this is this is different for him also. White Sox think the Royals might have something else in mind. Well, he, we've never seen Alex slash. You know, that's when you bring it back, fake the bunt, bring it back, and try to hit it hard on the ground. That's something he hasn't done to this point. But I think Alex right now is saying, hey, just give me some of the bunt so I can get him up here. He gets this one down, and Sale will play it to first base. Wow. That's all I can say yeah. is, wow. He is so lucky to get that bunt down. Just to make sure, Alex is going to go back to the dugout and double check all of his life insurance policies. Look, look his eyes get all big like that. I mean, he didn't even see his eyes were closed. He never saw that ball go off his bat. And I mean, that ball was really boring in on him, and it just happened to hit the bat in a good spot. Ryan, I just saw Alex walk by. He turned to Bob McClure and he said, Was that up by my face? Never saw it. 
Well, if anything, the Royals get Chris Sale out of the game, but Bobby Jenks comes jogging in with the winning run at second base and one out. That had, that had to be scary. Second base with one out and a couple of fastballs in the mid 90s up around his eyes. And I don't mean eye level, I mean up around his eyes. But he gets the job done, and now Willie Bloomquist will come up against Bobby Jenks. Yeah, you're right, Brian. Getting the job done is key, but I don't think he wants that duty against against Sale anytime soon. Now, any left hander has to do that. When you're a pitcher, sometimes when that guy squares around, you have a tendency to key on the guy and not on the catcher. But Alex said a good job getting the bat on the right plane to get this ball down on the ground. Marcace is at first base. Remember, the White Sox ran for Paul Canerco. Royals might not be getting Bobby Jenks at 100%. They had recently considered putting him on the disabled list. He's been bothered by back spasms. Willie really one for four tonight. He is 0 for seven against Bobby Jenks. One ball, one strike. White Sox have a couple of relievers that are not at 100%. J.J. Putz, who is Jenks' right-hand setup man, he's been bothered by a sore knee. Inside, two and one. Willie's had a couple of key plays today at the plate. Back in the seventh inning with two outs and a runner at first, and the Royals down by four. He singled against Freddy Garcia. And then Mike Avila singled. And then Unievsky Betancourt hit the game time grand slam. And then in the 10th inning, Willie made a nice play in right center field to help throw out a runner at the plate. He is swinging right over the top of that pitch from Jenks. Two balls, two strikes. Looks like a good, like a good hard sinker, right? The ball just fastball, just 94 miles an hour, just going straight down, and and that's nasty right there. This is where Willie gets a little bit tougher. He can go the other way. He can cut his swing down. But Jinx is boring the ball down underneath the swing inside. Goes with the pitch again, and it's three and two. Dedemede opened the inning with a walk. That was against Chris Sale. And then Alex Gordon bunted into second base. And now Willie got something in his eye. So Jenks is hard enough to hit as it is. 
You don't need to dig in there with a little bit of sweat rolling around in your eyeball. Got him. Man, that is just nasty movement. I think Willie about three different times in that at bat thought he got a pretty hittable fastball down the middle of the plate and the ball just disappeared. They just put it down under the swing and throwing it just above the knees and getting it to turn over. It's turning over right at the right time. So Betamid at second with two down. And Mike Avilas with two hits tonight against Bobby Jenks. 0 for 2 with a strikeout. That pitch stayed up, and Avilas fouled it back. So that was the pitch that Willie Bloomquist was hoping for, a fastball that stayed above the knees. This is game one of a double header. That's the pitch that Bloomquist had to deal with, and it's 0 and 2. A late swing to say the light, the least. <laughs> that's Avilas is still alive. That's what they call an excuse me swing right there. It's like, I mean, it's almost like he did it, respect the ball inside, and, and there you go. Body's going one way, hands go the other way. I think I was in a Raw's dugout. I think I'd have my head below the screen. Laid off the curveball. One ball, two strikes. Boy, if he's got that fastball sinking like it is and has command of that curveball. I mean, right now, he could live on that fastball alone. But throwing the curve just gives the hitter something else to think about. And plus he's got all that velocity to go with it also. About 25 to 35 minutes after this game, we'll have game two of the doubleheader. That's Brian Bullington against Tony Pena. Before that, as soon as the game is over, it's Boulevard Royals Live with Joel and Monty. Avilas is tied up. This is going to be a tough play for Vizquel. No play, and he almost got Betamid off the bag. Runners at first and third and two down. Well, you see Vizquel comes in here and bare hands his ball with no intention of throwing his ball to first base, but hoping that he could catch Wilson Benamy ground at third base aggressively trying to take a look at the throw to first base. And that's a veteran move right there. And here's Unievsky Betancourt. And the White Sox right now feel like they should have won game one and be in the beginning of game two, if not for Unievsky bleep in Betancourt. <laughs> Avilas takes off from first, and Betancourt takes a strike. And this is what we're talking about. A 5-1 to one White Sox lead with two outs in the bottom of the seventh, and Uni hits his third grand slam of the year, tying a Royals record, Danny Tartable, back in the late 80s had a three grand slam season. So second and third, two down. Uni also has a double tonight. And that's lined in the center field. And Uni wins it in the bottom of the 11th. 